Hello and welcome to the latest Expert Series webinar. Today's webinar is Fixed Income Strategies in a Rising Rate Environment. Are you really prepared? This is a complimentary ETF.com webinar courtesy of Wisdom Tree Asset Management. I'm Ollie Ludwig, the managing editor of ETF.com. We are the leading authority on news and data about ETFs and the company behind Inside ETFs, the world's biggest ETF conference. Joining me today is Rick Harper. Rick serves as the head of fixed income and currency for Wisdom Tree Asset Management. He oversees fixed income and currency products developed through Wisdom Tree's associations with BNY Mellon Corporation and Western Asset Management. Before we get underway, you should all know that you can ask questions at any time during this 60-minute webinar in the window at the lower right of your screens. I may ask a few questions along the way during Rick's presentation, but again, there will be a Q&A after his prepared comments. Also remember that Rick's presentation will be available to all of you by early next week. Considering the topic of Rick's presentation today, preparing for higher bond yields, we are gathered here today at an interesting time indeed. This year had already been shaping up as something of a surprise given, given the decline in yields that were seen earlier in the year. And in recent days, the market volatility has spiked, stocks are selling off, and bond yields are heading lower, not higher. But as any investors worth their salt know all too well, investing is really about expected returns. If stocks are selling off, the probabilities tell us that buying opportunities are often coming into focus. The same might be said for bond yields. Yes, the 10-year Treasury note ended last year at 3%, and yes, it's now yielding about 2.14% after dipping to as low as 1.87% during yesterday's hectic trade. Markets are fretting about everything from Europe's slowdown to the possibility that this economic recover, recovery will remain slow for quite a bit longer. That said, I submit that today is actually a very propitious time to think about how to prepare for the day when rates start to head higher. They will head higher, though these latest developments may give investors some extra time to formulate thoughtful approaches. Rick is going to lay out some broad brush strokes. He has a wonderful deck of slides that, again, as I said earlier, will be available to all of you within 48 hours after this is over. And he will include a lot of history about bonds. Uh, he'll take measures of where markets find themselves now, analyze some of the alternative scenarios that may come to pass, and lay out potentially appropriate strategies, including a number of Wisdom Tree products that his firm brought to market to help investors navigate a world of rising rates. Those include the Wisdom Tree Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Zero Duration Fund, the Wisdom Tree Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Negative Duration Fund, the Wisdom Tree B of A Merrill Lynch High Yield Bond Zero Duration Fund, and finally, the Wisdom Tree B of A Merrill Lynch High Yield Bond Negative Duration Fund. A lot to talk about in these 60 minutes. So with those thoughts in mind, Rick, you're on. Take it away. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ali. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Obviously, it's it's been a quite a volatile experience in the market over the last few weeks. And I think my advice to investors is the first thing you should do is take a step back consider where you are in the cycle and what your underlying beliefs in the economy is. We believe that the underlying U.S. economy is fairly resilient and then the market is a little bit too negative about what's going on in Europe and some of the other things transpiring. So we do sense, especially with Fed funds pushing rate hikes out to 2016 as of yesterday, we do think the Fed's a little complacent in terms of the current uh, dynamics within the market. And, you know, rates will rise, as Ali mentioned, it's just a, a, a timing and the conviction standpoint. And in framing the discussion in terms of what we'd like to address today, first off, we're going to talk about the current environment, but also we're going to look at traditional approaches that many investors have taken to rise in rates have fared since the paper tantrum, and a little bit of a history lesson. Yeah, and then we're going to look to the need for possibly new tools for managing interest rate risk and how 
expand, expanding and extending the available tools for rate risk provides additional flexibility for use in an advisor. And show some implementation ideas for some of the new strategies that uh, Ali suggested and how you can incorporate them in their portfolio. And then as the last thing, we're going to pivot to a strong dollar, which is obviously something that's been working since July of this year and why we think that the cyclical bull run in the dollar has some persistence and is likely to be an ongoing phenomenon uh, for at least the short to medium term. This is a chart that we're all familiar with from our, our history as investors in this market. You know, most of us have only known rates over the long term in terms of going down. But if you look at the last five years in which the zero interest rate policy has existed, you know, it's pretty obvious that the most likely direction for rates, obviously, over the long term is probably biased to higher and moving off of this zero interest rate platform. Now, with this reduction in rates, turning to slide four here, you know, this is a pretty interesting chart, and this really shows what the risk return dynamics are. With the drop in rates, that's obviously led to a drop in the coupon strain, which obviously provides cushion against the prospects for rising rates. And we'll see what, extent, what role that has played within the last few tightening scenarios. Now, this is a fairly simple chart in terms of you're just comparing the yield to worse in the Barclays aggregate and with increasing income compensation on the y-axis. And we're contrasting this with the interest rate risk, obviously mentioned by duration. And the further you go to the right, the greater the interest rate sensitivity is in the slide. And we break, uh, break out the monthly observations by, dec by decades and by interest rate environments. On the whole, where you want to be is in the northwest corner of this graph. More compensation for less interest rate risk. And given the decline in rates, and the longer term it takes to get cash flow back, obviously the interest rate sensitivity has also risen, and you find yourself in the unfortunate corner of being trapped in the southeastern corner of the graph, where interest rate risk has risen commiserately relative to the compensation you retrieve. And the margin for error has, has gone down so much that for only a small rise in interest rates, it could legitimately wipe out an entire year's worth of income. And if you consider with the dramatic fluctuations we saw uh, on Wednesday, you know, which we went from 186 up to 214, that single move, if translated to the ag, wiped out nearly three quarters of year income for the year. That's obviously going to be a heck of a lot uh, more painful if you were way out in the far reaches of the curve in, a, in, in one of these long-dated bond ETFs or something, I presume, right? Exactly, exactly. So, you know, if you consider where the duration of the 10-year is right now, it's right around 9, nine uh, you know, 9% nine move. So obviously if you get a 100 basis point move from a simple duration standpoint, that's a 9% drop in rates. Obviously, Vexity is going to mitigate some of that. But you can tell that the margin for error has definitely changed. And I want to thank Ali for helping me out there as I was struggling with turning the slides. But turning to the pressures on the yield curve right now, uh, obviously an improving U.S. economy and the Fed getting closer to the exit door uh, and turning with attention turning from tapering to potentially tightening and the Fed curtailing its purchases, those are all putting upward pressure on the curve. Now, the catalyst that could be offsetting that, and we can probably add a few, are the declining deficit the U.S. is uh, with, you know, increase in tax revenues and de decreased amount of issuance, and we see deficit decline. The increase in yield spread between the U.S. and other developed market countries has brought in overseas buyers, and we've seen an inordinate amount of purchases on treasury of treasuries by banks, uh, possibly in lieu of significant. Uh, loan growth as banks seem, uh, continue to leverage their balance sheets. Now, this is for old bond, uh, old bond managers here. This is, 
you know, looking through the Fed's position relative to traditional metrics. Now, the Taylor rule, you know, is, you know, sort of what rate is appropriate given the want, given the, the, the goal of attaining potential inflation, target inflation, and target unemployment. What is the appropriate Fed funds rate, uh, Fed funds rate right now? Well, you can see right now the difference between the Taylor rule estimate, which is 231, and the policy rate is negative 2, which suggests that a monetary policy is extremely accommodative when viewed through the lens of this old metric. And this metric is also part of the House bill that was to govern more stricter uh, Fed transparency. So it is still employed quite a bit. Additionally, investors are not demanding much compensation in terms of accepting that rate, short rates might not evolve in the manner they think they will. And this is using market expectations. And at 38 basis points with the end of 930, it's actually below 20 now. And if you include the central tendency provided by the Fed uh, in terms of the likely path of, of, forward rate, of future rate, short rates, this would actually be negative. So investors are not receiving much compensation uh, for the duration risk they're taking. Again, this highlights and reiterates that the margin for error is fairly light. Now, this slide, obviously, we probably discussed a lot of these slides and meetings over the this slide in meetings over the last few days, given the volatility, and it's become painfully obvious. You know, there is a large disconnect between the growth of the U.S. and the U.K. versus growth in Europe and Japan. You know, and the U.S. economy, given what transpired with the polar vortex earlier this year, has proved itself remarkably resilient uh, with trend growth to slightly above trend growth. But the U.S. is not, it's, it's a global economy, and the U.S. is not an island. And I think there's an inherent trust in a lot of the Fed policymakers that other developed market central banks and policymakers will do, in that Queen Draghi's word, whatever it takes uh, to stabilize their economies and ease some of the burden, the drag that might be elicited from from a turn down in growth. Still, there is slack. There is some slack in the labor market participation rates, and the fact, despite the fact that the unemployment rate is, has decreased so much and unemployment claims have decreased. We have failed to see an uptick in wages of a dramatic nature uh, thus far. Continuing tensions, tensions with Russia and ISIS, and while Chinese, the Chinese stimulus and some better economic numbers the last few days have given a little bit of pause, there have been some further concerns of China, Chinese growth as it transitions from a largely export-driven to more of a balanced economy. And I think this disconnect between, within developed market economies and their growth patterns is highlighted by this, by this graph. And I know it's a little complicated. I'll walk you through it pretty quickly. You know, the MAP Economic Surprise Indexes, and every street firm has it, Goldman's not alone in this, measures the anticipated trajectory of growth uh, from from consensus forecasts with the actual realization of uh, with the actual data numbers, and what you can see is the U.S., which is the blue line, showed a dramatic uh, series of disappointments with the polar vortex earlier this year, but since that time, around February and March, has consistently surprised to the upside. Europe, as represented by the green line has consistently disappointed, and as well as Japan, which is, you know, the, the consequences of the VAT tax have proved to be a little more significant, although there's been a little bit of improvement in data uh, recently. But it sh this does show the change in perception about U.S. and European and Japanese growth. The Europe uh, number there, Rick, it uh, excludes the United Kingdom, I presume, or is that integrated into uh, that green line that, that you showed? It excludes the United Kingdom. Yeah. There's a separate, and, and there's I, a separate I, index for the United Kingdom. 
And it would have, I would presume it would be a little bit more like the, the blue line that represents the U.S. there uh, in terms of yes, uh, uh, upside surprise? Yeah, okay, great, thank yes, you. There's, it's been a series of, you know, that hasn't been as significant as the U.S., but there have been a series of positive surprises uh, that have occurred in the, in the U.K. Now, one of the things coming back to me, and we've touched on it before, is there's this disconnect between what the market sees as the past short-term rates and what the Fed sees in terms of the central tendency. There, there are some claims that the central tendencies might overstate the Troika, Fisher, Yellen, and Dudley's view of the world by a little bit. But regardless, there is a significant disconnect between them, what the market thinks and what the Fed's telling them, which could be somewhat risky you know, in a market that is policy driven, you know, in looking at the old mandate, don't fight the Fed, specifically in a policy driven market, you probably want to do so at your peril. You know, a lot of discussion uh, has been over the past, what does the transition from taper to tightening mean? You know, with the added element, the pre-taper, the actual taper, and now the, the focus on tightening. And I think it is going to mean different things. I think a lot of investors, in preparing for the onset of rising rates and the onset of the taper, you know, in which in which the Fed was was buying, in which the Fed had been buying long, long dated maturities, a lot of people shorten the maturities, and this is a traditional uh, reaction to. Um, by, by portfolio managers into the prospects of rising rates. And so a lot of it is short in the maturities. And a common refrain we hear from clients is, I've made my trade. And I think given where yields are at this point, it could foster a little bit of a false sense of security, uh, given the sensitivity of the two-year area to Fed policy. And just to recap how various strategies performed, during the taper tantrum, we saw the long ends sell off, uh, and there were significant uh, sell-offs in both initially high-yield debt and emerging market debt, and somewhat in longer dated maturities, while shorter maturities preserved, preserved uh, preservation, uh, preserved, you know, and provided absolute returns uh, over the period. When taper actually began, and a lot of people were disappointed as yields declined, those longer securities benefited without much change in the short end of the curve. Rick, really quick uh, question here with, with regards to the yields dropping when tapering actually began. That, I mean, I've heard a lot of people talk about that. Some, some. Uh, you know, ranging from like the Fed is, you know, it's a sign that the Fed's totally ineffectual in a general sense to to uh, the macro economy just kind of like on the skids and this is all premature. Do you have a, a, a quick, uh, efficient take on, on on how that came to pass? It certainly was a surprise to a lot of folks, I think. I think it was a surprise. And I think the polar vortex in terms of the degree and the lingering effect uh, of the winter, I mean, data really didn't get cleaned up till about June of what? Of June of this year, I think had a pretty significant impact. I think we're standing at a very different place if economic growth was three plus throughout the year instead of the the two percent we're looking at right now. And I think there has been some disappointment uh, in Europe and Japan, and that's definitely influenced some of the drag down in yield. But I think the polar vortex really and the severity of it really surprised a lot of investors and took a lot of people people are back. Again, that polar vortex, that's, that's the general term for just that crazy winter that seemed to never end, and, and, and there was an un, yeah. unusually cold and all that business, that depressed business uh, sales and retail, what have the whole deal, right? Exactly. It, you know, it was the worst winter uh, since, I think, on record in some areas, and the worst winter since 95 in Chicago, where I went back and saw some old friends who were complaining about the, the, the extent and severity of it. But it really did have a fairly crippling effect on the economy. And it rolled in about the same time as the traditional concerns about Chinese growth started to, uh, to appear again. Europe started, as we saw, with uh, disappointments that started in March of this year. And you had, you know, added to that, similar to what's going on right now, you had the Japanese VAT tax, 
which kind of uh, uh, curb growth in its tracks a little bit. So there was a confluence of events, but I don't think you can understate the, de the degree of impact of the polar vortex. Thank you. In, in terms of looking at previous tightening periods, and I think this is great from a historical context and really draws in to the importance of where we are in terms of the degree of cushion we have. Once tightening begins, the only three uh, tightening scenarios we really have over the last 20 years is the, 90, uh, the 94, um, the 99, and the 2004. And I think the most important thing is the chart is at the bottom. Um, you know, it's the degree of, of, uh, of uh, benefit that the income return allow you to weather the price deterioration that we saw during the tightening periods. Now, we're not expecting rates to soar through the roof and to the degree that might have been during these periods where tightening was extremely significant. But the other point will cause you to and really drives this concern about the amount of cushion that you have is you look at the, where the Treasury yields were back in 93 and 98, and even in 2003, six months before the tightening uh, occurred, they were se seven to eight times more than the current uh, coupon yield. And even in 2003, it was over three, uh, three times as much. And that cushion enabled the two-year to post a positive total return. And right now, with it at approximately 33 basis points, that coverage is much smaller than it has been in the past. And we think this should encourage investors to really consider what the, uh, what the impact could be once tightening begins and how little margin for error there is and the sensitivity there is in, in shorter maturity securities. So how do you deal with a rising rate scenario? What other options are out there? You know, we were contemplating coming into the rising rate space and with the, the proliferation and the coverage on the short end of the yield curve, you know, we continually came back to this notion of what institutions do on a daily basis. And that is preserve their existing strategy, yet use interest rate overlays to extract some of the rate risk from it. And we felt that if we could package those commonly invested strategies with, with an overlay to reduce or extract the treasury rate risk, that would be a pretty effective tool for our client base in terms of expanding their options to mitigate their interest rate risk while not advertly affecting their coupon stream. And so we approached both Barclays and Merrill Lynch to create core and plus options in this space to create zero duration strategies on the U.S. aggregate and zero duration strategies on the U.S. high yield sector to create core and plus options for mitigating rising rates. And how this works out, let me see if, okay. It sounds complicated. As complicated as me trying to maneuver the slides, but it's really fairly simple. We start out on the left side of the screen. With, we're going to be long the act. We're going to give you a long exposure to core bonds. Step two is we're going to use an offsetting current, uh, offsetting treasury position to extract that treasury rate out while preserving the spread. You know, it's really a funded spread trade within the ag position. To the right, you see the net result. On an income level, we preserve the income stream of the existing uh, common uh, fixed income strategy while we mitigate the risk. Preserve the coupon, mitigate the risk. Now, the hedging costs, since within the fund we employ futures, comes is depleted out of the NAF. That's the cost that 1.68% is the cost of the insurance for mitigating the risk reduction. It does not impact 
at this juncture the coupon that the funds that the funds AGZD and AGND pay out. In turning to from the zero strategy to the negative duration strategy, essentially with the interest rate head, we're simply extending the maturities of the hedge to achieve the desired duration target under zero. In this case, negative five. This does involve some some curve risk since you're extending maturities out, which also does increase the cost of the hedge, as you see by the negative 2.54. Again, because the funds that this applies to use future, you're extracting the 2.54 implicit cost out of the NAV, and it's not interfering with the coupon stream. We've done the same thing with the, the Merrill Lynch high yield constraint, zero and negative uh, seven duration indexes. Again, we're long the high yield portion of the zero to five year high yield index. We construct an offsetting short treasury exposure to mitigate and reduce the interest treasury rate risk within the fund. The net result, and this is where the difference lies, that you are providing a, a still fairly high degree of income because of the high yield exposure while you're reducing risk considerably. On the negative duration, again, extending the maturities out, bringing the duration under zero. Slightly higher cost in terms of the cost of the hedge, but you're still providing with the backup and high yield rates a significant amount of income. And it's a really useful tool for helping investors mitigate their interest rate exposure. Quick now, question, uh, Rick, uh, before, before you launch into this next, uh, uh, this is, this is uh, duration hedge bond funds 101 type mm -hmm. question, really. Yeah. Uh, but lay out some scenarios where you might want the, um, uh, the uh, the zero or the negative. Well, why why might you choose one or the other? After all, we're talking okay. about the same underlying index and 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 the same mechanism to hedge, but a very different yeah. outcome. Uh, so hold my hand on that one. Oh sure, sure. With the zero duration strategy, it's going to perform uh, relatively well. Um, you know, as a completion strategy within a fund. It's also going to do a much better job reducing the risk. Obviously, when you incur some of the curve risk, you're taking more of an explicit bet and more of a shock uh, relationship with the negative duration for the additional rate reduction. And you expose yourself to some curve risk. So in a flattening curve environment, um, it's specifically one in which, and we'll get to this later, one in which short rates rise and long rates fall, you know, it's going to underperform the zero duration strategy uh, by by a fair degree, but those those tend to be relatively minor when you have the full inversion and full, the full change. But for instantaneous exposure to a steepening curve, the zero the negative duration is going to provide provide a lot more zig when the rest of the market zags. You know, the zero duration is more about preservation. It's more about keeping more of what you hold and tends to be a less aggressive form of the rising rate strategy than the negative duration does. Okay. Thank you. You, you know, like, uh, as Ollie mentioned, risks are involved, and there's no free lunch. And since the beginning of this year, the funds have underperformed. You know, and I think the total returns in which the negative returns, because the long end has rallied, have distinctly out underperformed uh, the zero duration and the underlying indexes themselves is exactly what you anticipate in an environment like it's transpired. So again, there's no free lunch. There are there are some risks involved in the strategy, but essentially you're positioning the funds and there are tools for the fund to give you more flexibility uh, as rates change. Now, one popular solution an application uh, to protect against rising rates has been moving into senior loan, senior loan debts, and there's over seven eight billion in senior loan ETFs, 
and there's 133 billion in mutual funds. Uh, there's a, there's some valid liquidity concerns and settlement concerns, and the presence of LIBOR floors does have the propensity that they they could wait to reward investors when rates rise. You know, one alternative that investors might consider is using a zero duration strategy uh, with a uh, high yield with using high yield bonds. And the correlations between such strategies, given the period we've looked at over the last five, five or so years, have been very strong at 0.9. And actually, when you strip out the, the excess return for high yield funds, it's actually provided a little more of a benefit with slightly less risk than the senior loan funds has, have at this time. So if either you're at max capacity with senior loans, you're a little concerned about some of the liquidity concerns, then high yield loans, but want to continue one spec exposure to speculative credit space, a high yield zero duration strategy might be something that you might want to consider. But I think the true value of these rising rate strategies is with the context of a broader portfolio. You know, many investors have gravitated from the core strategy to a core plus strategy. And with the range of options we have with the rising rate funds, uh, AGZD, our ag zero, AGND, our ag negative duration, our HYZD, our high yield zero duration, and HYND, our high yield negative duration, you can really put together a lot and mix and match a lot of different exposures and really fine tune your interest rate risk. And it's actually surprising the limitations of the yield sacrifice that you would that would be encumbered and the dramatic risk reduction by incorporating zero duration and negative duration strategies into your portfolio. And this can be seen in slide 19. If you look at bringing in a 20% zero core plus, that's an 80-20 mix between uh, ag, ag zero and high yield zero within a, a traditional core plus strategy, 80% ag, 20% high yield. And you'll see you get about a 25% reduction in risk. Actually, excuse me, a little more of a 20% reduction in risk for only 27 basis points in terms of reduction in yield. And it's really a great deal of value that becomes even greater as you go further and allocate more to the zero and the negative duration strategies. So, you know, as Ali mentioned, these slides will become available. And I urge you to take some time, look at how combining these strategies into your current portfolio might give you greater flexibility in terms of your risk return, uh, managing your risk re return. Finally, to go back to some of the, the risk elements that Ollie uh, mentioned before, you know, where do the strategies fail? What could go wrong is the question I think investors always ask themselves. Well, a 2008 environment in which you have a period of extreme risk aversion and sharp declines in interest rates and widening credit spread, which happened to a very small degree over the last, last few days, you know, a bearish curve twist, as I mentioned, this is principally the negative duration strategy, sort of like a 2003 to 2004 scenario in which they, they stopped issuing 30-year bonds and the 30-year bond uh, declines rapidly while the short rates actually rose. That obviously exposes the negative duration strategies uh, to, a fair, to some risk. Um, the cost of insurance goes goes, to, uh, goes um, without merit. Interest rates don't change. And the value uh, and the cost of that hedge um, expires worthless. And an underlying repricing of risk. What has been working within the investment universe? And what might be a precursor to rising rates? I think there has, and we came with a new strategy earlier this year, you know, we've seen a very strong rise in the dollar since about July of this year. And incorporating dollar bull strategies can benefit investors in not only rising rates, but also risk aversion periods as well. 
uh, current positioning notwithstanding. And you can see by this graph comparing changes in the VIX to changes in the Barclays Capital Trade Weighted Dollar Index going back the last 10 years, that periods of heightened risk aversions have tended to benefit the dollar relative to other currencies as investors have flocked to a safe haven. Obviously, I don't have to tell you the, the fact you have a strategy that zags or zigs when other aspects of the portfolio zag has a great deal of value within a risk averse version, version scenario and can add a lot of value to the portfolio. But probably more importantly in in the subject and in tune with the subject of this conversation is how can a dollar bill strategy benefit you in a rising rate environment? You know, we think that the policy divergence between the central banks, the relative economic prospects, and the likely inference in terms of relative rates has dramatic implications for the dollar. We do believe we have started in a period of a secular bull market in the dollar specifically relative to developed market currencies, but also in the near term, especially as the market starts to truly anticipate tightening, I think we will get a little bit of a setback uh, in the EM currencies while the long-term case continues to remain pretty good. And I think this economy between growth prospects between developed markets is heightened by this paradigm of central bank divergence. You know, when the Fed tightens policy and when the, the BOE tightens policy, you know, I don't think we can tell and line it up for sure because there has been some dust that's set on the crystal ball, although a 2015 hike still looks um, in, to be in the Fed's foresight. We know that the Bank of Japan and the ECB are not going to be tightening next year. And the fact is they're probably going to redouble extraordinary stimulus measures um, in the coming months. That's going to con continue to break and widen divergence that we've seen in policy. And that's really taken hold within the short rates. And the difference between um, the two-year rates and relative markets tends to be a pretty good precursor to a strengthening the dollar. And what we've seen as these relative inf interest rate differentials continue to diverge, and we have no belief that they won't continue to diverge, that's likely to going to provide a tailwind to the dollar against other developed market currencies. How do you play this kind of scenario? How do you, how do you tribute? What's, what, what, what's the strategy to determine or to assess or benefit from an increase in the dollar's worth? Now, a lot of traditional indexes are really um, stuck in the 70s, stuck in the 80s. The global economy has changed dramatically. And, you know, the dollar index, which is perceived to be, you know, has been a store of value, and the markets looked at the dollar index quite a bit, is still using Bretton Woods type weights. And while in 1980 that represented nearly 82% of the trade with U.S. partners, Right now, it only represents 42%. So how can I better reflect the influence of the dollar with, among its trading partners, the influence of the dollar among highly traded FX, FX currencies, and the influence of dollars in some, of your, in some of your international equity portfolios? You know, it should be reflective of the global economy. And that was the challenge to create a better benchmark that we, we accepted and worked with Bloomberg in creating the Bloomberg dollar exposure. Now, we want the exposures to be influential in the trading with the U.S. and the constituent currencies to be influential uh, uh, currencies within, within the overall FX markets. They need to be influential in both and highly influential in one of the two. And by developing this composite, which we balance on an annual basis, you know, the percentage of the constituent currencies in the trade with the U.S. of the Bloomberg dollar is 82% as of this year. It constitutes 94% of the overall FX trading volume. It is a much more balanced exposure 
to other regions around the world, as you can see by the weights on slide 24. And it is much less in terms of being Eurocentric. And why is that important? If you look at your international equity exposures at this juncture, the European exposure within the Acquia XUS is 23%. So the dollar index is offline with your international equity exposure, because the euro concentration, by 33%. And you can see in terms of on the right side and the, le and the left side, and right side in each of the respective tables, that the blends between the Bloomberg dollar index and the currency's exposures are much more similar to your international equity exposure than the Bloomberg, uh, then excuse me, the dollar index is. What's the relevance? Well, for those of you who are sitting on gains in the international equity exposure and may not need or, or consider our currency hedge equities in which we've shown the value of reducing the volatility through hedging out the currencies. Incorporating a dollar bull strategy can help offset some of that currency exposure. It can help you play defense. It provides both the cash component involved in your cash allocation with a little bit of zig compared to your international currencies exposure stack. And we strongly consider that you take a look at how this strategy might work for you within an overall portfolio. You know, to wrap up our discussion, I know it's a very testing time in terms of volatility that's currently going on the market. But I think I advise investors to take a step back, consider what they would have thought was cheap two weeks ago. It's more than likely a little bit cheaper now. And, but treasuries are more expensive. Does the current levels of the treasury market seem synchronous with the underlying strength of the U.S. economy in particular? Right now, market valuations are suggesting a very limited margin for error. Not to say that, you know, this is going to be exposed now or in the very short term. But eventually, rates going to tick up. And there's not much cushion to protect an investor within the current fixed, fixed income market. Tightening will be different than tapering. The short end of the curve moves in anticipation of tightening. It didn't move in anticipation of taper. We think traditional approaches might disappoint, given the limited amount of cushion and the sensitivity of the front end to the uh, sensitivity of the front end to, as the Fed starts to truly move towards tightening. We, we offer the packaging institutional overlay strategies within ETFs can help broaden the amount of tools that you have in managing your, your, your interest rate risk and the relative yield and risk combination within your fixed income portfolios. The dollar, which is sort of anticipated this rise, uh, eventual rise in rates, we believe is in a secular bull market, specifically relative to developed market currencies. But as the market starts to embrace for higher rates, we do believe there could be a step back with EM currencies, while that doesn't deter us from the long-term story in EM. And the dollar bull strategies can be incorporated at diverse far within portfolio, offsetting currency exposure within EM within uh, institutional equity accounts, and also providing some, uh, some zag when markets zig as a portfolio diversifier. And at this point, I'll open up any questions um, that you might have, Ali, or any of, the, any of the listeners listening in might have. Perfect, Rick. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, as Rick just just said, uh, as I said at the beginning, if, if you have any questions, uh, the lower right of your screens, you can you can enter them, and uh, we will certainly uh, put them in a queue and uh, and serve them up. Uh, I just wanted to, to circle back. Can we go to slide 26 just for a quick moment, uh, uh, Rick? 
Um, I just wanted to, to, to clarify the point you're making. Uh, certainly the dollar strength has been sort of manifesting for a while, and you're saying essentially it, it, it is a fairly reliable signal that, that, that is telling us what the capital flows are coming back to the, the United States in anticipation of a rate hike. Is that, is that, the, is that a, a, a fair summation of, of the basic idea here? I think historically it has been. And I think okay. it's, it's reflective of the different economic experiences of the developed markets and different relative uh, economic prospects, for that matter. And that tends to be manifested in itself in terms of rates. And I think the dollar right. is just, you know, a little bit ahead of that and serving a little bit of a precursor to it. Right. And I don't know if you actually mentioned the Wisdom Tree ETF that that uh, uh, carves out this. Uh, this index that you guys came up with that's moving oh, sure. beyond the, the, sure. the historical, the US, USDU, it's the Wisdom Tree Bloomberg US dollar bullish, and uh, that that has like 60 million in assets, which is pretty good. It must suggest some decent liquidity. Um, and are there any part, other parts of the, the offering? You, you would short that? You don't have a, a short version of that, right? That, that's security that you would short, no. correct? If you, no. if, you, if you were bearish on the index. Yeah, basically, you benefit from the uh, appreciation of the dollar against the respective currencies. You know, we do have the ability to create a, an offset of that and might consider that at some point. I think it is, just to give some kudos to you guys, it was named ETF.com's Currency Index of the Year last year. So obviously, I think we were on to something at that point. Oh yeah, I think I think that's sort of a, a pet peeve of a lot of people in the financial markets about the the dollar index. It certainly it continues to to have some kind of uh, you know symbolic value, but it, but it's not real world. You, you lay that out pretty nicely. Now, just clarify the discussion of the dollar. Certainly, the trend of, of dollar strengthening uh, being an early suggestion that maybe rates in the United States are are going to be heading higher. Um, situate USDU in a portfolio in the context of this discussion we've been having this afternoon. Um, where, how might you use USDU? Is that, is, is, is that a, a way of sort of a, a cash holding of sorts in connection with a, with more tactical approach to the bond market? Or, am I, or, or I mean, help me see this in context in okay. this discussion. Okay. I, I think you hit it right on the head. I think one of the, the big uses of it, if you break down the components of USDU, and in any currency fund in general, you have a, a USD cash component, and then you have the exposure to the forwards. So think about it in terms of the context. M most clients have international equity exposure and international bond exposure for that. And they might be sitting on gains and might not want to liquidate the gains and, you know, seeking like a local equity exposure like a currency hedge equity account. So it really provides a nice balance. And the cash right now is really not doing anything for you at this point. Um, basically, you're, you're lucky to earn any type of return at this point. So it's given the imperfect correlations. Now, we've seen that looking at a bunch of different trade-weighted uh, indexes historically uh, before we created the dollar, that the typical uh, correlation between that and the Acqui U.S. is about between negative 70 and negative 80. So putting on your 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 mean variance hat at this point, it, it really tra uh, transmit into a fairly huge hook in the typical asset allocation curve. And actually, in some some senses, some studies we've done, a combinations of dollar bull strategies and international equities, you know, lead to significant risk reductions relative to similar blends of USD cash and international equities because you are, are offsetting a portion of that currency exposure that adds in, you know, an adverse environment adds incremental risk. Okay, thanks. Now, I, if we can go back to slide 19, uh, is that, uh, can, you, can you flip the deck back there, please? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, you laid out some, some real-world possibilities here, right? 
how could could these four ETFs that you've discussed, the uh, the duration hedged ones uh, and then the zero and negative, how could you use them in in, in the real world in in context? And and one of the themes we hammer on here big time at ETF.com, it's not you know what the return is, it's really what is the variability of return? Can you control that variable in 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 the context of what a particular client's uh, desires are? You know, whether it's putting a kid through college or or uh, or buying a second home or or or, or you know uh, legacy issues, whatever. And um, th these these pairings that you laid out on slide nineteen really caught my fancy because they're very granular. And I'm wondering, as you put these together, do you have data? that touch on this issue of variability of returns. Uh, if I were to want to do a deeper data dive here, could I really have a look and see, well, what, how would that shake out? And what Rick said here, you know, with the 80% core plus and 20% zero core plus, you know, what have you. There are many options you laid out here. Uh, and there's, there, it, it's a minefield of data. Is, is there any way that, uh, that anyone who had interest could dig deeper here and really take measure of what you're suggesting here? Okay, well, I, I think the indexes are available uh, on Bloomberg, and you can see them on Bloomberg. Obviously, the real-time history st uh, of the indexes starts with the funds, but the indexes are available on Bloomberg, and um, you know under under the tickers of uh, BAZD, uh, TRUU, um, and there, there's I guess in all four that's information I can provide to you, Ollie. Then maybe we can provide with the slides. You know, uh, in terms of those those stickers, uh, but they are available yeah. on Bloomberg for anyone that has. Yeah, that that, that might be available. sensible. Yeah, that, that. Okay, great. No, I I I, I, I think that's a uh, oh, go ahead. They are also available on the, for those of you who don't don't have access to Bloomberg. They are available if you reach out to uh, the index providers, and we can help you guys in that regard. Okay, great. Um, we have an audience question here about uh, the uh, the forex market. Uh, how are you getting your access to the Chinese uh, foreign exchange market in the context of uh, USD? Oh, sure. We're using uh, C and H forwards uh, are the forwards that we're we're, we're using within the, the and those are deliverable forwards. Great. Now let's uh, talk for a moment about the rate outlook. Again, you seem to be erring more on don't get caught by surprise here. The, the markets uh, in recent days are telling us uh, uh, that stocks are selling off, the yields are dropping, et cetera, et cetera, as I was saying in the beginning. But you're still saying middle of 2015, right? It, it, more I or less, think, that's kind of I what you're saying, prepare for? I think the Fed's communicating that in a, in a policy-driven market is probably isn't the best thing in the world to you know, not give credence to what the Fed says. I, I think the market's a little enthusiastic by pushing it after December 16th, I mean, uh, 2016. Um, and I think, you know, it's, I think someone should appear cautious. Um, additionally, there is some dust on the crystal, crystal ball, as we mentioned before, and it's not completely clear. But given the information we have now and, you know, two weeks ago, you know, we were looking mid mid-2015, uh, and I don't think uh, until we get more information that would lead us otherwise, I think we, we take the Fed at its word that um, mid-2015 mid is still still a very uh, viable possibility. Right. So, so are are you sort of suggesting? And I'm not asking for your market call here, but just to kind of you know put the the macro picture in focus a little bit. Are you suggesting this is more of a pullback that might actually look rather healthy in the rearview mirror, rather than some definitive uh, uh, renewed trajectory? You know, led by Europe into into a much more troubling zone. Is that is that kind of uh, the yeah, takeaway I, here, considering the, the underlying strength in the United States? Yeah, I, I think that's my initial take on that, given the information that that. We have our disposal. It seems a little ex overextended. If you look at the behavior of the ten-year Treasury on on uh, Wednesday, it, the round trip I think was somewhat of the sense of about fifty basis points uh, because it went all the way from two eighteen to one eighty six and closed back up at two fourteen, um, which is one of the most volatile days I think in the history of anyone I've talked to uh, in terms of the reaction. Two thousand eight, probably notwithstanding. So it, it did seem a little bit overdone, and there was a little fear mongering that was out there. And 
you know, as I mentioned to you a little bit earlier, Ollie, everyone seemed to take the most negative view they could of any of the data that came out. And, you know, drop in oil price cannot be a completely uh, written off as, you know, a bad thing. I think, you know, obviously U.S. consumers are now 20% richer in terms of the gas money they would be spending. So, yeah, I'm glad you, you mentioned the uh, the oil price. Uh, uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely on point, and that's germane to the rate picture. I, I, I Part of me has to think that the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, must feel like they, maybe they got a little more breathing room that with oil prices dropping. I think I read in the Wall Street Journal what one penny in the drop of the gasoline price equals a billion that gets pumped into the economy elsewhere. Boy, that adds up, right? You just said 20%. Yeah. I mean, does does this at the margin? bring the question into focus that maybe this mid-2015 target date that you had just spoken about is maybe worth questioning. Uh, I mean, if this uh, pullback in oil is sustained and, you know, somewhere around 80 bucks a barrel for WTI kind of holds in place more or less, I mean, it seems that's a fair question, is it not? Well, I think one of the things to remember on terms of the inflation front, people focus on the core PC deflator, and that's the Fed's primary target in terms of assessing one of the inflation metrics that they assess, and that only has second round impacts from the oil. But you have a first round impact from the drop in gasoline to consumption within the economy. And so there, there could be a really positive aspect to consumers, and that could feed through to growth. So that could counterbalance some of the negative drag that we're seeing from, from global growth. And But in the midst of the chaos yesterday, no one even considered that as, as a possibility. And so we'll see how things play out and see how, uh, you know, how the picture emerges. But it does seem like it's, it's more of a healthy, healthy correction at this point than anything that is dramatically, uh, that has dramatically changed the picture. That just from the data I've seen, maybe I've been, um, I'm missing something. Right. Thanks. May, uh, one more question. We're, we're drawing to, to the close here. Um, the biggest risk of, of, of holding these uh, four ETFs, the, the uh, duration hedged ones, uh, what, what is it? Is it, is it that rates don't do anything, that, that, that rates actually continue to, to drop? What, uh, talk about the oh, downside yeah. of, of, of well, owning these for a moment. You, you touched on that, but, but yeah. elaborate a bit. Oh, the, the biggest downside is the rates that we enter into a period like 2008. That's obviously the biggest, the biggest concern. Spreads widen because you have a, a lower rate price and a risk, and rates fall through the floor. Um, so that is the potential downside. I, I think, you know, if rates don't change, um, I think a lot of investors, even though they've given up some income, would, would think, well, okay, that's the cost, the cost of providing additional protection. I, so I don't, there will be underperformance, but I don't think it would be uh, dramatic underperformance. Perfect. All right. Well, that about wraps up uh, the, uh, the time we have together. Uh, thanks for attending our Fixed Income Strategies in a Rising Rate Environment. Are you prepared? Uh, thanks, Rick, for being here. And thanks oh, for the thanks audience. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And uh, thanks for all the questions. Uh, again, as I said earlier, I think this is a good uh, deck to look at it more closely. It will be available to all of you in 24 to 48 hours. And uh, you'll all re uh, receive uh, instructions in an email on how to obtain it. On that note, on behalf of uh, Rick Harper of Wisdom Tree Asset Management and my colleagues here at ETF.com, I'm Ollie Ludwig wishing you all a very pleasant afternoon.